Good evening. On behalf of the physics department, I welcome you all here. I would like to point out that physics society is a society run by the students of the physics department, but members, of course, all the people who are members of the physics department automatically become members of physics society. Uh, so students have an executive committee which decides the program and implement it. Of course, there are faculty advisors, and Professor Amit Datta happens to be one of the advisors. So today, I would request Professor Datta to introduce the speaker. I don't read it. So, uh, very good evening to all of you and for me uh, it is homecoming because I spent 30, not 36, more than 36 years and from 1970 December till 2007 December. And last time I taught the course here, a science elective was also in this room. So, I am extremely thankful to physics department for giving me the opportunity to come back home. So, when you grow old, you will realize what is the meaning of that. And 
for all practical purposes, IIT Kanpur is my first home, not second home. So I think uh, when I was requested by Professor Manna to spend some time, I come to Allahabad for the academy meeting. Then I decided that rather than uh, sitting idle, if I can uh, give a series of lectures on this very fascinating topic, which normally we do not come across because it is nowhere in our curriculum or so. But I think when I myself worked or studied this for last 7, 8 years, then what happened that uh, Ramakrishna Mission Institute of Culture, Calcutta and the National Academy of Science, they plan to bring out an 11 volume series on history of science in India. The uh, primarily the chief editor was Professor Sharma who was earlier INSA president, NASI president, MGK Menon and all such SK Joshi. So their uh, directive was that there are books very, uh, I will say um, very knowledgeable, very important books, but they are not within the reach of common students or common readers. So we were told is it possible? that you write all of us, that means we are quite a few authors. It was on physics, mathematics, this is the part on astronomy which I wrote. So it is a, it, the whole thing was released in the month of March. So I thought that uh, since we worked, uh, I had to work quite a lot, uh, why not I share some of the things I read, studied and really felt not only fascinated but also proud. So therefore, this lecture, five lectures which I have planned will be primarily based on the book and I have uh, brought one extra copy. I want to give it to the PK Kelkel library so that any one of you who want to read some of the things you can refer it to it. So I will hand it over to Professor Choudhury. You can arranged to keep it in the central library. So I think uh, uh, the first thing if you permit me at the age of 74, I feel more comfortable if I am allowed to sit by my audience. Aap ke liye to problem nahi hoga. So the first uh, point is that uh, why this particular topic? We all know that the ancient astronomy scientifically the values or the theories of uh, those uh, times are not really tenable of not much importance now the modern astronomy. Why we study this or why we listen to this? So the point is why I think you should or any Indian should do it is that it you will find it amazing the brilliance of the mind of our ancestral scientists and philosophers. That is one thing. Another very important point is that astronomy is something which attracts even the primitive people, is not it? Because every day they find sun is rising, moon is rising in a different shape, they are changing. All those things attract the attention and they start observing. So one of the earliest branch of science which gets developed in any civilization is astronomy. Secondly, astronomy also, particularly in India, it had lot of link with our cu cultural activities, sacrifices, various festivals, all such things. That means it is closely linked with the society. So if you get the glimpse of the astronomy of the ancient times, you get lots of ideas about the concurrent society or the contemporaneous uh, activities of the country. It also gives, you will see later, that uh, many astronomical references can give important clue for the, uh, the chronological order. That means at what time this happened, it is not difficult to find out if you look into the astronomical descriptions of that particular time. I gave a lecture uh, here next room on archaeoastronomy and the astronomical dating of the Puranic texts. Only from the description it is possible to date, you know. That is of course a separate topic. So another important thing is that uh, as an Indian I find that 
to know about the ancient activities is very important, not just for knowledge, but for bringing back your self pride and self respect. So, I think that these five lectures I have planned, um, many of you I hope that you will enjoy, otherwise why I will expect you to spend five wonderful evenings. Of course, here are evenings in the month of August not uh, or July not that pleasant, but even then I think uh, the semester has just begun there will be many new friends and so evenings are quite useful here, but I hope these five evenings you will not repent after spending here. So, how we have planned is there will be five lectures each one I said one and a half hour because the subject is vast hundreds of people have worked for 4000, 5000 years. So, therefore, it is not so easy to encapsulate everything in only five lectures of one hour duration. So, I suggested that let it be one and half hours, so that I am not pressed too hard for time and go too quickly over certain very important issues. Second thing, I think the level I have kept it at the high school level, frankly speaking. You will not require any special knowledge or any high level uh, spherical trigonometry, etcetera. We are not going to go into that direction. Our objective is somewhat different. Those who are interested in learning how to calculate tithis, nakshatra, etc., the book is there, you can refer it. But here it will be primarily the basic physical concept behind the whole thing. The primary source I will as I mentioned will be this book which I am keeping the copy in the central library whenever you want you can read. Because the references you will find in this book which are quite uh, large and some of them are very old and a complete set of references and bibliography you will get in this book. The lecture topics will be the first lecture what I want to do is the story how ancient Indian astronomy was rediscovered. It was rediscovered we all forgot, but it was rediscovered by the colonial rulers who came from Europe. It is a very interesting story. And then of course, we have to talk little about the very fundamental rudimentary aspects of positional astronomy. Because many of the terms etcetera which and moreover as a common man as you have to learn little bit of common history. So, which direction sun rises, why it changes some very basic thing will be desirable. That I would I hope to finish today itself. Uh, second session will be on pre Siddhantic astronomy. You will see that our whole ancient Indian astronomy can be divided into two periods primarily. One will be pre Siddhantic, another is Siddhantic astronomy. This explanation you will come later. Pre Siddhantic astronomy, the last book which we find is Vedanga Jatish which is dated as 1400 BC. So, before that, that goes to pre Siddhantic. And then the first or second century AD onwards, what we get that is called Siddhantic astronomy. And third lecture will be a discussion on Siddhantic astronomy. And then after that, we will discuss the medieval period when the West Asian astronomers came with the new rulers from West Asia, Islamic rules came. And with them, something came to India which was actually reflected back and that also I will discuss. I will also discuss what is Z's astronomy and we will discuss little bit about Soai Joy Singh which you are quite familiar. And some very tragic things what happened that why Soai Joy Singh could not be the pioneer of modern astronomy in India. And the final lecture will be on introduction of telescopic astronomy here, survey of India and interesting stories connected the very pre preliminary uh, motivations actually like the transit of Venus which really started the era of telescopic astronomy in India. And finally, I will have some discussion on the debate over the originality and antiquity of Indian astronomy. So, I hope that uh, this will end and I hope to cover all these things also in this time. So, so as these points I have already discussed and I will not going to repeat it and uh, 
This also I have uh, discussed. The structure I have also mentioned just now. The first lecture, second lecture, third, fourth and fifth lecture that is also I have mentioned. So, the story of the rediscovery of ancient Indian astronomy. What happened you know? The first hint of ancient astronomical knowledge in India uh, came to India in a very interesting manner. What happened that the French government sent a team to Thailand which is which was called Siam in those days uh, to the king, but there was a coup in the palace and all the French people had to leave in a hurry. They brought the 12 uh, centimeter telescope which they went with that also they came brought back and then Pondicherry was a French colony at that time. So, they came to Pondicherry uh, in the year 1687 and with that those things they also brought some fragmented tables, some charts etcetera. So, they did not know what is though what are those things. Then I think the astronomer Cassini he examined those tables and charts they are in very fragmented form and showed that it was required to subtract that means their calculations for positions of the sun and the moon, but you have to subtract 3 minutes from the sun's position and 40 minutes of hour from the moon's position. And then he decided that it means that all the reference median for these tables was 18 degrees west of Siam and that was found that it is it matches with the uh, meridian of Varanasi. And so, the link with India of that ancient uh, tables was established. And the another uh, uh, person also found some more such tables in the uh, Karnataka state of Karnataka and so on. But uh, nothing much happened till uh, when La Gentil returned from India in 1769 after observing a transit of Venus at Pondicherry with amazing experience about the capabilities of the Indian Pandits in astronomical calculations. So, experience of La Gentil attracted the attention of Bailey, Laplace and Playfair. So, you know what happened? So, uh, uh, the La, La Gentil one day uh, called one Pandit and gave him some task that can you find out these eclipse time and position. So, Pandit sat on the floor with some curries, curries means some cells, snails and uh, some tables in palm leaf tables. After 45 minutes, he brought the whole result and La Gentil was amazed to see that they are very accurate. Not only that the time, position, everything is told, also the various phases of the eclipse also that fellow could tell. The further amazing fact was that uh, Pandit uh, was not a very educated person and he was completely unaware of the principles on which these tables have been made. <coughs> so, therefore, you know he was very amazed and he realized that the, it must be based on some ancient knowledge which is now lost. <coughs> However, I will not spend too much time. Then lot of researchers started studying, but there are two groups among them. One group was saying that yes, there was very extensive knowledge base in, in astronomy in India in the ancient times. Another group was there, they said that all nonsense, they are all copied from Greek etcetera and so on. The problem you see, uh, like say Laplace originally was very impressed, but later being influenced by others, you know they said okay, perhaps they are accurate, but they may not be very old. <coughs> then a good analysis of Surya Siddhanto was by in 1789 by Samuel Davis and it, all the calculations they found that the ancient astronomers they are excellent uh, quality uh, excellent accuracy. But then what happened that Surya Siddhanto why they were having this kind of problem I am telling you. In one group they are saying that it is impossible to believe that these guys they used to call us niggers in those days that they could do something, some science so many years back 
which contains so much of truth, it is impossible. That was a perception, you know. But when they calculated the results were very accurate. So, now see that uh, such antagonistic attitude I mentioned just now towards anything Indian origin was not uncommon among western scholars. Bentley thought that the Hindu astronomical literature was nothing but a mass of forgeries framed for the purpose of deceiving the world respecting the antiquity of the Hindu people. You know that was his contention that it is a complete forgery, it is very recent, but they have done it so that rest of the world thinks that yes in ancient times they are great people. Similar att attitude was also noticed in the writings of Whitney, he was an American astronomer when the uh, Surya Siddhanta was uh, published by Burgess I believe in 16, 1856. So, he writes I have those books actually from what we know in other respects of the character and tendencies of the Hindu mind we should not at all look to find the Hindus in possession of an astronomical science containing so much of truth. They have been from the very beginning distinguished by a remarkable inaptitude and disinclination to observe, to collect facts, to record, to make inductive investigation. So funny you see and I do not blame them because the society at that time in the 18th and 19th century was so degenerated if you read the history of our society at the contemporary society, I will not blame the uh, European scholars to feel this way. In the 19th and 20th century, many Western and Indian scholars have worked on ancient, but the problem, another problem was the knowledge on Sanskrit, which is the principal source of all the knowledge on ancient uh, astronomy, was not that good. They had to depend quite a lot on pandits and others who to translate. Secondly, a large amount of writing they are in allegorical form. In the, that was a character of all our ancient text, they are in allegorical form and to extract the real meaning requires a kind of knowledge, kind of uh, mindset which they did not possess. That was also another difficulty they had. So, many others like say in the 19th century Max Muller, Burgess, Brenner and Weber, Thibaut, Jacobi, S. B. Dix. He now among the Indian, the primary work which I have found one is Shankar Bal Krishan Dixit, then Bal Gangadhar Tilak, Kalinath Mukherjee, and 20th century Sham Sastri, P. C. Sengupta, and G. R. K. That they are the 20th century people, and rest are all 19th century. These books are available, but only thing that the best book I think is Shankar Bal Krishan Dixit 1896, it, you can't find that, it was published in Marathi and later in 1940 meteorological department of India, government of India they published a translation. After a lot of trouble I could trace a copy in the positional astronomy library in Calcutta and I got a copy, but it is not available either in the internet or in any library. So, it can be mentioned here that many studies were facing serious difficulties to match the dates. Another problem was that Max Muller's Aryan invasion theory. He hypothesized that 1500 BC all the Aryans came through Khyber Pass and they started the Vedic civilization and he had an ad hoc assumption about the date of Rig Veda as 1200 BC which was the first and ended at 200 BC. So, the dates were conflicting with this hypothesis and lot of scholars who had lot of faith in this theory. So, they were finding very confused. Once later and the verses of Vedanga Jatish, you will find Vedanga Jatish when I come later to pre Siddhantic astronomy tomorrow. It is uh, like Rig Jyotish and Jujur Jyotish. There are in total 49 uh, verses, very difficult. But when it was uh, deciphered, they are nothing but algorithms for calculation. And after all the things of Vedanga Jyotish is completely deciphered, now it is found that it, it was written around 1400 BC. That is accepted by all people. We will come to these points later. But once this uh, work by S.B. Dixit was over, the Indian astronomy, ancient Indian astronomy could be divided into two major parts. Pre-Siddhantic astronomy starting with Rig Veda ended with Vedanga Jatish. 
and Siddhantic astronomy started after a long dark period that also I will mention quickly later and reached maturity in the 4th and 5th century AD and the first great astronomer you have heard about is Aryabhatta 1. The set of lecture is not meant as I mentioned for experts and professionals, I will not teach you the calculation procedures they are in the book, but it is primarily the whole uh, phenomena or the physics behind the whole thing. And some very basic idea about the positional astronomy is uh, necessary, even as a common man we should have these knowledges and I will take uh, some time for that. So, basics of positional astronomy. What is positional astronomy you may ask? It is the finding the positions of the sun, moon and planets in the background of fixed stars for specified times. Then celestial coordinate system, how to use a coordinate system to identify its location, phases of the moon and predicting eclipses, identifying equinoctical and solstice days. These are what are the primarily duties of positional astronomy. And nowadays you know positional astronomy is very much used, which of course far more sophisticated uh, software for panchang creation by the government of India. The positional astronomy center their main purpose, job is to create the panchang. The points to remember as I mentioned that the system is heliocentric we all know, but the observations are from the earth that you have to keep in mind. And study of the apparent motions of the celestial bodies with reference to the frame that is fixed on earth is the key issue that we have to always keep in mind. To understand the matter better, it is desirable to first study the real heliocentric system. You see, you all know these things, you must have studied in that there is sun and around sun the earth is going in an elliptic path. Of course, the eccentricity is very small and it is also its uh, axis is inclined uh, to this plane of the orbit at 23 and half degrees, it is spinning and at the same time it is revolving around the sun. So, here you will find that this plane in which earth goes around the sun is called the plane of the ecliptic. The reason why it is called ecliptic that whenever moon is on this plane and it in conjunction or opposition there is an eclipse. That is why this plane is called the plane of the ecliptic. And then there are four important positions. One position when the inclination of the earth's axis inclines towards the sun directly. That is the summer solstice in north uh, uh, northern hemisphere it is summer. So, this is the summer solstice when the axis is inclining towards the sun, the day is the la longest and opposite to that when it is tilting away from the sun that is the winter solstice. Solstice word has come sol means sun and solstice indicate it is stationary. You know you will find that the sun is going from north to south during this period. Now, when it reaches the extreme end it appears to be stationary for few days and then it that is called the Xinayan or Uttarayan and it starts going back. Again it will come here and it will slowly stop and then again. So, therefore, these are the positions when the sun's motion appears to be stationary and so it is solstice, one is summer, one is winter. Two other important days are there when the inclination sun is here and it is inclined in this way. So, both the hemisphere they get equal sunlight and they are called equinox. Equinox word has come, equinox is Latin, nox means night. When the night is equal to day, that is why it is called equinox. One is spring equinox and this is autumn equinox. Now you can judge that uh, uh, which direction earth is revolving, you can easily find out. Can you tell me clockwise or anticlockwise? <laughs> no, the, because you see that spring equinox and after that only summer solstice will come. Then will be the autumn equinox, we are approaching 22nd September, then will be the winter. So, it has to be like this. Two other important positions are there, one is called perihelion, that means the position nearest to Helios that is sun 
and now this aphelion which is away from the sun. So, this is the real thing and this same thing what I have shown there. Now, here uh, one thing we have to now discuss little bit. Now, what is our background? Background is the fixed star. Now, you will say they are not fixed, they are moving at tremendous speed of 200, 400 kilometer per second, but their distance is so, so large that even in the whole human civilization, the movement is not perceptible. The great bear, Saptarshi Mandal, all the stars are moving with large tremendous speed just like the sun, but for thousands of years it will look like the same because the amount of distance you will see it to move in few thousand years it is imperceptible. So, that is why apparently they are all fixed and it is called the background of the fixed star. All the things and position movement we see of sun, moon and planets that, that, that backdrop is called the starry fixed uh, the, the background of fixed star. There, so how do you locate? Say for example, you know we tell that there is a star here. You find the full moon against this star. So, it means what that we are in this position because full moon means moon must be opposite to sun and if full moon is against this star, <laughs> you know that this is the configuration. So, after 6 months what will happen? After 6 months earth will go here and you know then that sun is against this star though you cannot see that because sun is so bright you cannot see that. So, this is the way astronomers tell where is sun, where is moon. Moon is very easy, but in case of sun you have to consider what happens after 6 months. So, that way it, there are such markers in the sky to locate the position in the sky which is other way absolutely vacant, nothing is there. Now, when viewed from the earth, the sun along with the rest of the heaven appears to rotate. That means, it was the reality, the sun here and earth going like that, but actually what happened, what we see that rather than sun and our going, it appears as if we are here and sun, kinematically it is equivalent, you know. So, that is why it looks that sun is going down the whole uh, universe is rotating. And this is what is the apparent uh, to the ancient astronomers, uh, this was the situation, earth is at the center, then moon, then mercury, then Venus, then sun then Mars, Jupiter and Saturn, these are the only planets or because sun and moon used to be also considered as planets. So, these seven planets you know uh, they had. Now, you see as I mentioned that just now that uh, now I will define few things. This is the plane of the ecliptic where earth goes, but from earth it looks sun is going. So, it is the same thing, sun appears to go like this around sun apparently. Now, and earth is at the center spinning around its axis which is tilted. Now, there will be two circles, one circle which is the equator of the earth, this is this one, another one is the intersection of the earth's surface or sur earth's spherical surface with the plane of the ecliptic. So, this is called the ecliptic, the yellow one. Now, so what happens? You see it is interesting that sun will be always appearing to be on the ecliptic, is not it? And so, you see today you go and you find because this is the horizon and the heaven is going like that, the whole heaven is rotating, actually earth is rotating. So, say sun is here, so sun will go like this, all the stars go. After a few days you will find sun will be here, it will go up like this. After another few days sun will be here, again it will appear to go there. So, you will find if you trace the sun's location on the starry background of the sky, it will draw a curve and it is nothing but the ecliptic. This line is called the ecliptic which is a very important thing. Another line is very important that is if you take consider the equator of the earth and imaginarily expand it and take it to the celestial sphere. So, you, you get another circular line that we call as the celestial equator. It is nothing but the projection of the terrestrial equator and it is also nothing but the uh, intersection of earth's surface with the ecliptic plane that circle you have expanded that 
and this is nothing but the path which is taken by the sun. And since most of the planets because of the origin of the solar system all the planets etcetera they are more or less located in one plane slightly this way that way. So, therefore, all the planets moon etcetera are never far away from this line which is ecliptic that is also another point to be noted. So, what happens that this is the earth rotating, this is our horizontal plane, this is the eastern direction, western direction, northern direction, southern direction and this is the zenith and so you can see that this is the ecliptic and another is the celestial equator and the sun is on the ecliptic on different locations at different days of the year and location is defined by the star against which sun is there which you will be able to notice or record after 6 months locating the full moon's position. Resulting observation will be with earth axis being tilted from the normal position, sun's path in the star background is called the ecliptic which is tilted from the celestial equator, you have seen that. The sun's position changes during a year and on the equinox days it is where? it will be the intersection point of the ecliptic and the celestial equator. There are two nodes and these are the two points where sun is there on 21st March nowadays and 22nd September. So, then what happens, sorry, we find suppose if you are standing here at latitude 5 you will find on the equinox days sun comes here and goes like this over our heads and sets. On the summer solstice day the you will find the sun to rise to the extreme left or extreme north and this will be the line which will be taken by the sun. On the winter solstice day it will be rising at the extreme right or extreme southern point and move like this. So, sun is always in this band throughout the year. If you are standing on the equator you will find on the equinoctical day sun is going like this and on summer solstice it will go like this, winter solstice it will go like this. If you are in Australia somewhere it will appear to be something like this. So, you can see a photograph taken from the same location on 4 days of a year. On June 21st you will find that is the summer solstice day sun you will find to rise here. On the equinoctical days you will find sun to rise here and on December 21st winter solstice you will find. So, you can see sun is rising here on the summer solstice <coughs> and here on the winter solstice. These are the photograph taken <coughs> from the same location on these 4 days at the sunrise. And so therefore, now let us see this is the celestial dome you know our sky you know. This is the celestial equator it is nothing but the expanded form of terrestrial equator and projected on the celestial dome. This is the ecliptic which is the intersection that circle of the earth sphere with the ecliptic plane expanded and projection projected on the celestial. So, therefore, these are the important things and these are the two equinoctical points, these are the solstice points. Now, how do you uh, record the position that I will discuss later in more details, but you can see that you have to locate the position of any planet or sun or anything on the celestial dome. Now, say for example, uh, one way of uh, uh, observational astronomy nomenclature is that how to locate the position. So, what you do you go along the celestial equator and then again you go along the longitude kind of thing and wherever you are it tells you. So, this tells you the declination like our latitude and this one longitude is told by right ascension and since it comes back after 24 hours right ascension is generally given in terms of the time. So, many hours minutes seconds and declination is given in degrees either south which is negative and north is positive. So, like say currently if you say Sirius this is the location of the Sirius how do you say now this is the ecliptic 
and this is the celestial equator. So, along celestial equator you go how much 6 hours 45 minutes and then declination is minus 16 degrees and 43 minutes. So, this is the way it is now you are saying that it is going in this direction why it is plus can you can somebody tell me. Yeah, actually it is you have to see any sky map you have to see this way then only you will find it will not be confusing. We will come to these things little later again. So, the plane of the ecliptic I have already mentioned. So, uh, you all know that and this is the celestial dome, this is the celestial equator, this is the ecliptic and these are the equinoctical points and these are the solstice points. The south celestial pole, north celestial pole. Next it is important to discuss the background against which the movements of the solar system bodies are observed. So, some idea about the system in which our solar system is embedded we should know that. Solar system is located in a spiral galaxy called Milky Way galaxy as presented in the next slide. So, this is our uh, Milky Way galaxy, this is the galactic center and sun is somewhere here, this is our solar system. The you know that diameter of our Milky Way galaxy is about 100,000 light years and we are approximately at 30,000 light years away from the center. This is the Milky Way you know I will not discuss you all know about Milky Way. Now, the nakshatra system or the lunar asterisms which are very important. You see you consider yourself 5000 years back night sky you observe that sky the moon every day looks different. So, you observe that today it is thin crescent or oh, now it is somewhat bigger half moon then it is becoming thicker and ultimately a full moon. So, you notice it, but how do you also locate the position of the moon? You notice because today the background stars are like this, tomorrow when I see I will find a different background star. So, what the ancient astronomers in India did, what was the easiest and obvious way to do, they took every day and the moon takes 27 days to come back to the same group of stars in the background. So, they found 27 groups of stars along which moon is going through the whole period, they call this as nakshatras. Nakshatra is not one star, a group of stars or that is called lunar asterisms. So, these were the earliest markers in the sky ancient Indian astronomers found and it is purely an Indian system. So, these 27 nakshatra system decide the whole astronomy as you will see soon in the pre-Siddhantic period. Siddhantic period we go to sign system or Rashi system that is a later thing. So, these groups of stars which identify the positions of the moon every night during a lunar month. This is not a lunar month actually, this is less than lunar month as you will see. This is the position of the moon takes 27 and few days and few hours to come back to the same position in the sky, but the lunar month is called from one full moon to another full moon. So, that is little longer 29 and half days. So, you will see that later why it is so. So, therefore, 27 nakshatras sometimes it was 28, but mostly it is 27 nakshatra that is the defining coordinate system or marker system in the old. So, you see now how do you do it our uh, galaxy if you see sideways it will look like this you are all modern students you all know that <laughs> we are here. So, naked eye we cannot see beyond 500 light years or 250 light years. So, obviously, in those days without telescope our universe is confined to only this region which is 500 light years across. If you expand it and you will find that the groups of stars in the galactic this region they gave names like Jestha, Mula, Purva, Sala we have heard all these names. So, these 27 groups of stars they identified as 27 nakshatras and they were named like this. So, 
So, the zodiacal signs are the constellations which span the positions of the sun during every solar month during a solar year. So, there will be 12 of them. So, we will discuss these things later. So, it looks like this that sun is here, earth is here and so for example, say July 21st sun is against what? Sun is against cancer. So, that is the summer solstice time it is very hot. Then in winter say December 21st sun is against what? Capricorn. So, ancient days they were very surprised that why, why it is happening when sun is in Capricorn it is uh, cold, when it is cancer it is hot and that is why astrology came into the picture as a uh, subject, but that is not our concern. So, the 12 zodiacal signs are these, you have perhaps you are familiar with the 12 zodiacal signs and this is the relative location of the zodiacal signs and also the nakshatra system in India. So, this is the Aries, this is the Taurus and so on, this is the Mesh Rashi like that, Mesh, Brisha and so on, there are 12 and these are the Ashini, Varuni, Kritika, these are the nakshatra, they are relative position wise, they are located in the sky like this. Now, observation of the periodic motions are as you know, diurnal motion, heavens rotate about the celestial pole axis once a day and night, the basic unit of time. Then slow creeping of the sun and moon, then they, they notice that the in the fixed background of the star, their position is shifting and they also notice some other star like objects are shifting or wandering that is why they are called planets. In Greek language planet means wanderer. So, these uh, five planets or seven planets they ultimately uh, considered as the moving bodies in the sky and they are always very near the ecliptic, sun is on the ecliptic and the whole pattern repeats after an year thus there is nothing which will distinguish one year to another astronomically of course, this year you are in first year, next year you will be in second year obviously. And the moon's phases also you know that this is the earth and sun is from this side. So, here it will be new moon, then as it goes this will be waxing crescent, then this is the first quarter, the waxing given gibbous, then this is the full moon because sunlight will falling completely and you can see the full circle and this is the waning gibbous third quarter and waning crescent. So, these are the moon's phases. So, coordinate systems for locating heavenly bodies, there are three different systems which are used. We will not go into details, but it is better that you just follow it. The systems are similar to that used in locate a point on the earth surface like latitude, longitude kind of thing because this is a spherical surface and celestial dome is also a spherical surface. So, as I showed that one is called the equatorial system, you go along the celestial equator this one hour, two hour, three hour that is called the right ascension. Traditionally why they are doing it you can say easily they could say degrees one degree up to 360 degrees perfectly all right, but that is the tradition in which they did and the latitude is something like that declination that is minus and this is the plus. And where the origin that is very important, origin of the coordinate system is always the vernal equinox. Now, you see here I will tell that in ancient Indian tradition, uh, you know the origin is a fixed place. In the European or the Greek uh, astronomy, it is always the vernal equinoctical point. But due to the precision of the equinox, you know it is 26,000 years as I will say later. So, the vernal equinoctical point also shifts. So, our system the origin is always fixed the first beginning of the uh, uh, Rashi Aries, they call Meshadi, Adi point means beginning. So, this is a fix that is why it is called Nirayana system. Indian system is very peculiar it is Nirayana the or coordinate is fixed. In western system it is Sayana system where the starting point is the vernal equinoctical point which shifts approximately 1 degree in a century kind of thing. So, that is 
different you know. So, this uh, these two terms you should be familiar with Sayana system and Nirayana system in Indian astronomy we always adopt the Nirayana system. This is ecliptic system another system where again you start from the vernal equinox and go along the ecliptic and that is in degrees and perpendicular direction you go something like language latitude. So, this is another system. Another system which is very useful is that you are locating you have a vertically up east, west, north. So, that is another system which is called horizontal system where sorry you are standing here this is your zenith this is the northern direction north pole. So, to locate a position of a star <coughs> what you do you find out star point if you project here on your horizontal and this line you get then this is called the azimuth and this angle which you get from horizontal to that position that is called altitude. So, azimuth and altitude system is very commonly most of the telescopic uh, things you do you can use this system it is convenient. Now, deviations from the, pre, uh, the periodic scheme just now I mentioned uh, one is precision of the equinox due to which the equinoctical points shift in the fixed starry background. Of course, advance of the perihelion you are that means again the perihelion point aphelion points also shift in the starry background and secular retardation of earth's rotation earth is slowing down. So, obviously, the time will gradually slow down this is another change and some other phenomena like 23 and half degree is not constant it oscillates with a period of 44,000 years you know eccentricity of our, our ellipticity of the earth's orbit also changes everything is actually periodic except except this secular retardation it is not periodic. So, this, uh, this is the axis of the earth which is moving in a cone it move if it is spinning in this direction like a top then precision is in the opposite direction from east to west and our spinning motion or daily rotation is from west to east. So, these uh, videos were there, but I think uh, I will not uh, waste time in this. So, what happened due to the precision of the equinox <coughs> this point if you draw an arrow the our rotational axis if you rotational vector. So, this point will trace a circle in the celestial dome and all since the whole thing is the ecliptic is there and therefore, since this whole thing is also changing like this, this point vernal equinoctical point shifts to the west. So, this is also that video I will not show here. Now, some effects of the precision of the earth's axis. The intersection of the ecliptic and the celestial equator slowly moves westward and the celestial pole continuously rotate in a circle about 23 and half degree arc in radius it is quite obvious. So, what happens today the celestial pole is here about which our axis is puncturing the celestial dome there and there is luckily a star here we call it what polaris, but I think in 0 AD there was nothing you know there was no pole star. Again when you go 3000 BC then you get a star that is called Thuban another pole star. So, 3000 that if you find any record of any pole star in the ancient text it has to be around that time because after that there was a long time there was no pole star. Again I think so therefore, see that we are lucky to have a big pole star now, but most of the time there is no pole star. See the shifting of the equinoctical point you can see it is here today 1000 BC it was here 2000 BC it was here like that and today it is here 2000 AD. So, therefore, you can see the equinoctical point is shifting. So, again this precision gives a difference because what happens now 
if you look into the eastern direction in the December or end uh, beginning January when it is cold, you will find a very important constellation called Orion is rising in the east, Kalpurush we call in India. 13,000 years hence, it will be just the opposite. Peak summer you will find uh, Kalpurush is rising in the east, in the northern horizon it is summer. So, this is the kind of change with seasons the relative position of the stars, constellations and the seasons they change because seasons depend on the equinoctical point and solstice points and they change in the background of the fixed stars. Now another thing is that moon and earth is very important. You know that moon is going around the earth like this and earth is also moving like this. And moon's orbital motion, you will find this orbital plane is about 5 degree different, you know, it is not the same plane as the ecliptic. Now, you see solar and sidereal time, it is another thing. Anything which is referred to star, we call sidereal. Like, say, for example, earth is here, sun is in this direction. So, sun will be apparently against some star here. So, after some time, sun will again appear to be again in this direction. So, it is this. So, when again this happens that is called a sidereal day. Like say that it has rotated this point has again come and sun is found to be again again in the same direction. Here is better to use. So, you will find that when you come back to another position where sun will again appear to be against the same starry position then it is called sidereal year. They are slightly different and day is from one sunrise to another sunrise. Why it becomes different? Because if it is in, you are here when it is a sunrise, it is rotating like this, you are coming from the dark region, just sunrise is here. When you go to the next sunrise, earth has moved here. So, you will find that you will have to rotate little bit longer extra. So, day will be slightly longer than 360 degree rotation. So, that is called mean solar day 24 hours, sunrise to sunrise, whereas sidereal day will be slightly different, it is 23 hours 56 minutes. When sun appears to come back to the same position in the sky, that time is slightly different, slightly less because of the earth's orbital motion like this. Say moon say for example, again the same thing. Say here, this is the moon, this is earth, this is sun. So, it is a full moon day. Now, full moon is against this star. So, what happened? The next full moon, that means when it is again in opposition, whenever it is diametrically opposite, it is called opposition. <coughs> so, earth has moved here and moon has to go here to be in opposition. So, it rotates 360 degrees plus this extra degrees. So, one full moon to another full moon is somewhat a longer period than when moon comes back to the same position on the sky to star again. So, therefore, this is called a sidereal uh, the earth moon full moon configuration, it is the next full moon configuration. And that is why you can see one is called the period is called a synodic month when it goes from here to here one full moon to another full moon synodic month or lunar month. Another one is called sidereal month. That means, when the moon comes back to the same position in the sky. That means, when it will be here, but moon will be here. So, that you see it against the star A, because this is parallel of course. So, therefore, sun is here, where earth is here and moon is here. That means, it has not rotated that much. So, it is little bit ahead of the full moon position. So, that is called the sidereal month and full moon to full moon is synodic month. Again as I said that the orbital plane of the moon is slightly inclined 5.4 degrees with the ecliptic plane. And there are two points where it intersects the plane of the ecliptic, they are called nodes. So, when it is going like this, it is called the descending node and when it is coming up like this, it is called the ascending node x and y. Now, how to, how can you get an eclipse? For eclipse, moon has to be either in opposition or in conjunction, that means they must be in one line. And moon has to be also in the ecliptic plane, 
then only it will be a possible to have an eclipse. So, this x y must be in the direction of the earth some direction. So, luckily what happened that this plane is also rotating. So, this x y line is also rotating <coughs> and so when uh, this is all eclipse you know. So, when the ascending node uh, descending node and ascending node and they are in the same line along the earth sun then this is the right situation for having an eclipse either uh, lunar or solar. Uh, so, and this period of this rotation is uh, and it always it rotates at 19.4 degrees per year. So, this line is rotating. So, not that that every full moon will be a eclipse or every new moon will be an eclipse. So, for example, say now this is an ecliptic situation that means this line is that we line of nodes is towards the sun, but it is rotating 19.4 degrees per year. So, when again this, this kind of situation will come when earth is going like this when it has come here by that time line of nodes has rotated by 19.4 degrees and so you will find that this is the situation for having next time then they will be along the sun earth another. So, this particular period 346.6 days is called an ecliptic year kind of thing. This is the, the called the eclipse year. So, after that again the eclipse will start taking place. So, the advance of perihelion position you know for the planets at rates are as much you know this is this so much per century for Mercury which is quite noticeable for earth it is this and for Mars it is this. So, this phenomena also you know. So, comets you know they are a small clump of ice and dust they do not have much uh, uh, importance unless you are observing a periodic comets. And this is very important that in ancient Indian astronomical texts there are reference to comets which are periodic and comet periods are pretty large you know like say Halley's comet is 76 years or so. So, you can realize that the observation of European scholars that they are not observant is not correct. And in those days if some sage or some astronomer noticed a periodic comet it used to get the name after that particular astronomer. And this you know this uh, the comets follow large elliptic path and the how the, the tail uh, comes you are all student of science and you know that. So, these are some of the, the Halley's comet, this is another comet. So, they are in different path different like there is another comet which has a period of 17,000 years. Meteors they are again you know that has hit earth they are called meteorite. Meteoroid is a chunk of rock or dust in space and a meteor is the streak of light in sky produced by burning of a meteorite uh, in earth's atmosphere. Asteroids you know they are the objects revolving around the sun, but too tiny to be called as planets. So, these are the meteor, meteor, meteor shower. Now, it should be noted that in positional astronomy only the angle between the heavenly objects can be seen nothing else. So, this is something very important to know that you can only find out angle accuracy means that in naked eye astronomy till the telescope it was naked eye astronomy the highest possible accuracy was achieved by Jai Singh it was one minute of arc. And currently do you know our present technology can find out an angle of nano arc second to that accuracy level. So, first session I will end here, but not finish I have something to discuss from here because I kept some time for you to ask and ask question. So, few important things which I will tell one is that the, the markers in the sky the nakshatras 
they are all named and their locations are there. So, therefore, all the ancient Indian astronomy which were based on moon's position, they are called nakshatras. Now, very interestingly you will find something I will tell you now, that when you go the how they identified, suppose in the old days calendar you have to produce, how do you make a calendar? Calendar means what? The particular day in a year. So, you have to tell the month, the day and the hour or the time. How do you identify a month? Now, the ancient Indian astronomers has a very unique system that you all those nakshatras you have seen, moon's Rig Vedic name was Masa and whenever moon becomes full, Purna Masa against a particular nakshatra, that particular month is to be given that name. Like if Purna Masa is in Vaisakha nakshatra, the name will be Vaisak. So, they used to identify that way. That is how we got the name Vaisak, Jeshtha, Jeshtha was against Jeshtha and so on. And what happened? That Purna Masa means full moon, but ultimately it we got that word Purnima, Purnamasi from the same thing. And then again, what was the name of the moon Masa? It becomes the word for month we call Ma. So, ancient situation was that from one full moon to another full moon was month, but it was in the very ancient times, Vedic period. Later, in Vedanga period or Puranic period, it was changed from Purnimanta system to Amanta system. So, from one new moon to next new moon was the month and the name of the month will be on which nakshatra the full moon takes place. Nowadays, of course, the system is not exactly this, but the names have continued from this philosophy. You know. So, you can identify the month locating that which particular full moon is against that nakshatra. So, the month is identified. Then they divided the full whole lunar month into 30 period, 30 lunar days. Lunar days has a special name in India. Do you know that is called Tithi? Tithi is actually again another purely ancient Indian astronomical term. So, this Tithi is nothing but a lunar day. When you divide a lunar month into 30 units, we get Tithis. So, you tell the name of the month you tell then there was a major division of paksha. So, when the moon is becoming new moon to full moon, it is called Shukla paksha. Another is from full moon to new moon that is called Krishna paksha. So, you mention the month, you mention the paksha and mention the tithi. So, you identify the day. And then within a day other kinds of things that I will discuss when I discuss your Siddhantic astronomy there. So, that way they used to now we say on such and such day 15th of January in uh, say 2 o'clock we will meet if you tell your friend. So, he has to know when is that time. So, same thing they did, they will tell you the month, paksha, tithi and also tell the time. So, this was the kind of basic structure which they are evolving which is very logical because uh, observing sun is much more difficult and it was done much later. Another very interesting thing I will tell you here and you think about it, I found it in the literature and I do not know where is the connection because connection with the uh, Hellenistic astronomy that is Greek astronomy was only when Alexander came that is how the people say that after Alexander came here and then there was some contact which was established with the uh, Greek people and many things came. But another thing you will find in Rig Veda, what is the term used for uh, Venus? It is Vena. Vena in Sanskrit, Rig Vedic Sanskrit means daughter of sun and the name of Venus uh, planet in Rig Veda is Vena. Now, Vena and Venus, it cannot be a coincidence, I personally think. Again, you will find in Rigvedic time, I will come to that in detail, the uh, 
direction to exact south because south pole was not visible from northern hemisphere, they used to connect two stars, Alpha Canis Minoris and Alpha Canis Majoris. And when you add these two stars, it pointed exactly to the south in 4000 BC, not now of course. Again in Hellenistic astronomy, uh, they, are uh, they are described in Rig Veda as dogs, red eyed dogs. And Greek astronomy again it is canis means dogs. So, but uh, how the Rig Vedic terms go into the Hellenistic astronomy is again a point I have not found any reference or any work on that, how that connection was there. You know. So, some of you can definitely really start thinking, finding literature and uh, you can really bring out many new things which are still not known. When was the connection established? It is not just during the Greek, maybe much before that. Some people have suspected that, some European astronomers and they have mentioned that, that perhaps the connection with Indian astronomy to Western astronomy is much earlier than the Greek period. And many of them they feel that the flow was from east to west, not the other way around. So, that is one very important interesting thing you will see. Now, few things I have not discussed here, that is the details of the eclipse and your uh, the Bakragati and so on. Instruments also naked eye astronomy, there are some very interesting thing like say if you hold one adult your hand at and a normal finger, how much angle it will subtend with your eyes. So, that they considered to be as uh, I think uh, 1 degree they considered. When it is like this, they consider as 18 degrees. If it is like this, then it is 10 degrees in normal case. And this, so this is actually they said 4 degrees and this is also 4 degrees each power at arm's length. So, that is also very crude way of measuring angle of the angular distance between the planets, you know how they did. Of course, the very important other instruments they also used, one was the Gnomon that is the Shanku which was used extensively and for time measurement the Klepsidra, you know that there are three types of things, water clock, but the most commonly used was that uh, uh, pot kind of thing which a hole and when it gets completely filled up you know. So, and they, they designed that in such a way in a whole civil day they call Savana day sunrise to sunrise it will, it, it will I think the 60 times it will get filled up like that. Another very interesting thing I found that the division of degree into uh, uh, 60 is original ancient Indian astronomical thing. 360 degree is very obvious, can you find out the origin of 360? 360 days in a year kind of thing. So, sun's position they thought it is one 360 degree and they divided each degree into 60 minutes. I will come to that later. So, many of the thing what we do use, but do not think that everything has come from the west. Many of the things which we use are actually of Indian origin. Next I think what I will start, I little bit I will make use of that because <coughs> here it was very simple descriptive. When I start presenting Siddhantic and Trisiddhantic astronomy, then I have to go slowly because they will be all new. Here I did not go slowly because most of the things are known to you, you are all science students. That our story will start in the prehistoric period and in India also we have found some Stonehenge kind of system. In the ancient time you have seen Stonehenge and stone structures which were used in the primitive time for some very basic uh, astronomical things. Like say on when you see the eastern direction, 
what is the farthest point when the sun rises? That is the summer solstice day. So, the stone structures used to be made in such a way that that direction was told. Why they did it? You can ask. The reason was because the seasons were associated with the sun's position. So, they needed to do that, that when it is harvesting time, when you have to start the sowing, all those things. So, they needed some basic clock, year clock on which you could say otherwise you do not know whether it is going to be right time for harvesting or right time for starting sowing etcetera. So, in India, Hanam Sagar in, in uh, I think now, uh, now Telangana, not Andhra Pradesh. So, Hanam Sagar is the one such unit where they have stone structures and with which you can find out the direction of the sunrise at this winter, summer solstice, direction of the sunrise in winter solstice. Also, the moon's extreme northerly and southerly positions also that has been found. Then the next when you come to next prehistoric period that is your Harappa and uh, Indus Valley civilization we call. Uh, it has been now found out that the earliest settlement which has been found at Mehergarh which is dated 6500 BC that means 8500 years old and it is a full fledged city you know. So, therefore, from that the, the people have tried to figure out whether they had astronomical observations. It is quite obvious because you are so civilized this, uh, society cannot do without astronomy because most of their major structures they are having very accurate north south directions just like the pyramids. And actually you know the pyramid dating has been done by considering the error they have made because in the ancient time a particular configuration of the northernly stars they used as pure because the pole star was not there. So, you had to use other stars. Later it was found they used the same thing, but it was wrong because things have shifted. So, here also it has been found in Mahanjadaro and Harappa, the major structures are slightly, the later Mahanjadaro period they are slightly erroneous because in the very early days they used Thuban as the north star which was accurate, but by it was I think uh, 2700, I think 2700, uh, uh, 5, 550 when it was exact north. By 2500 BC it was already 1 degree away from the north and now it is 7 and a half degrees away from the north. So, therefore, um, uh, many of the structures in uh, Indus Valley cities they are found either exactly to the north which are the very ancient structures, but slightly uh, erroneous because they use the same Thuban star as the pole star which was not. So, that is the time. So, the another thing they found, they found some crescent side uh, bone structures with 30 markings which meant it is a lunar month and they had to keep even now Andaman some of the aboriginals will find they maintain this kind of a calendar with 30 groups and the groups are also bigger groups, smaller group the which says the phase of the moon and that kind of stone uh, not stone by uh, bone so they have been found even in and another thing which was found in Kashmir valley very interesting there is a uh, 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 stone structure uh, piece with lot of markings and pictures. One picture shows that hunting deer etcetera with two suns. It has been interpreted as one sun and one supernova and supernova must have taken place very near to the ecliptic plane because otherwise it cannot be very near sun. And they have now you know now everything is possible with computer. They have found out that that happened around 5000 BC there was a major supernova which took place near the ecliptic. So, it could be near the sun at some time of the year and that is some of the very ancient astronomical observation thing and some Harappan seals they have shown seven sages which majority of the archaeologists they interpret as seven stars of the 
Saptarshi Mandal, but Asfak uh, thinks it is the seven stars of uh, asterism Kritika. These are something. So, even in Harappan civilization, there were evidence of astronomical observation and certain recordings are there. Though we have not been able to decipher the language satisfactorily, but some of the records show clearly astronomical observation. So, these are the uh, prehistoric period, but actually we will then start discussing the Vedic period what astronomical reference we find. That is the pre-Siddhantic astronomy which we will start tomorrow. So, if you have any question, I will just tell. Yes, please. Rahu and Ketu are the two nodes, you know, and in the ancient times, uh, many Indian astronomers considered these also as two planets. But later, even Aryabhatta 1 knew very well that the Rahu and Ketu are not planets and why eclipse takes place, it is due to the moon that he mentioned in his. Yeah, please, Professor Man. Tycho Bhai did 2 minutes of accuracy, yeah. Actually you see uh, Jai Singh, I will discuss this, Jai Singh wanted to improve the accuracy and he thought that you know if you make the things very big etc. using stone and masonry, your accuracy will be better. So, he could achieve 1 minute of accuracy, but unfortunately even 3 centuries before the Uluk Beg, his system or his observatory produce more or less the same accuracy. So, Jai Singh could not achieve much because even 300 years later he produced the same accuracy as Uluk Beg's observatory you know, but his objective was primarily to improve accuracy. Just yeah please. Actually what we find in Siddhantic astronomy we find the 12 uh, Rashi and zodiacal signs names are same as the uh, Hellenistic astronomy that is why people think not only that the seven day week. In the uh, pre-Siddhantic astronomy in Vedas there are reference to Sharaha that means six days, but the seven day week system uh, and the same name that is actually from uh, they say it is I will discuss it uh, day after tomorrow that is when you discuss I will discuss in details you know how it came. Chaldeans, most probably they started first, it went to Greece and then came to India. But before there was a week, but for six days, Sadaha, not Saptaha. Yes, anything else? I will tell you one thing here, you know, why astrology came as a subject? As I mentioned, the people thought that when sun is in Cancer, it is so hot here, it is in Capricorn, it is so cold, in the moon's phases and the tidal phenomena and you know the women they have their period which is also a lunar month. So, that way they found that when it is Purnima or Amavasya, the pains, joint pains increase, they have all physical explanations. But to believe that they also decide that when your daughter's marriage will be properly done or your son's examination will be good, this I think there is no scientific background. But the kings, remember progress of astronomy was because of astrology. Even in Italy, in Galileo's time, Galileo used to earn extra money which he needed badly to pay for the dowry of his two sisters mathematics professor's salary was not at all enough. It was 1 20th of the salary of a medical doctor and law professor. No? So, you know what he did, he used to teach astrology to the medical students because it was a compulsory course. Doctors were required to cast a horoscope of a patient when he comes and see whether he has enough time to leave and then do treatment properly. Otherwise, do not spend too much time. So, he used to teach astronomy and astrology to medical students who used to pay quite a lot of private tuition fee to him. So, these are all old concerns because the kings were interested in whether the next war he will win and his court astronomer he used to make predictions. Now, to make predictions uh, dependable and trustworthy 
he had to do astronomy and had to predict eclipses and other things. That king on such and such day the sun will be eclipsed by and he says yes it is happening. So, if he says king on such and such time if you start the war with your neighbor you will win. So, he will do that. But I personally to me astrology has no scientific basis. Yeah, please. When did the idea of heliocentric system come into Indian astronomy? Uh, you see, uh, Indian astronomy hints of heliocentricity is there in the late Siddhantic period and Kerala astronomy. Kerala astronomy, there were some hints. It was something like Tycho Bahe system. But one thing remember, the daily rotation of the earth was told very emphatically by Aryabhatta 1. He has mentioned in his book Aryabhattyam that the heavenly motion is due to earth's rotation. Sun never sets, sun never rises is also told very clearly in the Vedic literature. But the orbital motion of the earth it is not found anywhere. Yes, please. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, when did that start? That started, I think, the uh, ion chalan, what is called the precision. Uh, ion chalan start, it is not found in pre Siddhantic astronomy. <coughs> Only in Siddhantic astronomy is there, ion chalan is mentioned, and they accurately found out the value which was much more accurate than the Greek value. So, that they did, and they, uh, as you said, that they had to have a zero precision year, you know from which they will make their calculation. So, when I uh, bring the method of calculation, so it will be seen how was their methodology, where it was required to count the number of days, ahargana. So, there the, the starting point, the zero precision year, quite a few different astronomers they use differently, but it is in, yeah, it is, there is a difference, yeah. Thank you.